bride of Christ, right? So we got to get Jesus' hand on our back. I want you to feel it this morning. And so it's a work of God that needs to happen here this morning with your cooperation, okay? So let's pray to that effect here now as we jump into God's word. Lord, we understand that we are flawed. We understand that we are not perfect, but we are yours. And we understand, Lord, that your spirit is in us. And we understand also that you have instructed us that we should follow the spirit's leading in all areas of our life. As we gather here as God's people, corporately, we pray that we would feel the hand of our Savior on our back, leading us in the way that we should go. You tell us that faith comes from hearing the word of God. And so, Lord, as we hear your word proclaimed this morning, out of this much flawed messenger, Lord, but we pray that your word would be flawless and that your impact would be massive upon our lives this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we, uh, when we got saved, well, we've been studying this book of Acts thing, but now we're doing this, and when we got saved, uh, like the book of Acts would teach us, we are, we are called into a movement, right? We're not called just to believe some stuff, right? A lot of people believe the Bible. A lot of people believe that Jesus was this guy, this rabbi guy that, that went to a cross and paid for sin and all that kind of stuff. Like, we're not called to just believe in God, but we're called by God at salvation to be a part of a movement, right? To be part of a movement, not just a belief system, but a belief system that inspires action, right? So, so I heard it said, I was listening to your boy Paul Washer yesterday. He, he, he says something so very true, and it's so obvious, but I don't know if a lot of us really get it. Everything in the Bible is a call to action. Every single thing in the Bible, just, just open up any letter that you read here, especially in the New Testament, and these guys that wrote it, they're under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but they're begging like Romans 12 too. I plead with you. And it doesn't matter what he says after that. He's asking you to do something. He's not just asking you, he's, he's what? He's begging you, right? It's that important that you do this, right? It just so happens to be that he says, I plead with you to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. What's the only thing that you really, really have? Yourself, right? All the other stuff can be taken away. The only thing that you've got is your life. And God says, give me your whole life. That's a call to action, right? Now, I don't want to make you feel guilty because I would, if, I, if I did this to make you feel guilty, I'm going to feel real guilty right there with you. But I would just say this before we get into the word this morning and find out what God's asking us to do this morning. Weigh your life versus that plead. I plead with you to give your bodies as a living sacrifice, as your reasonable worship. That's reasonable. I've said this before, i say it again. God would say, I- I'll take more than that, but I'll settle for everything that you have and everything that you are. I plead with you to give yourselves as a living sacrifice. Just picture yourself crawling up onto the altar and saying, here I am, God. I'm yours. Take me. Th- that's what Paul's illustrating to us. In Romans 12, 2. And so we're called to be part of a movement led by King Jesus and empowered by his Holy Spirit, right, to go and reach, this is frightening, every person on earth. Yikes. Every person on earth. And so we need to substitute what we all have been taught that our highest goal in Christianity is personal heaven. We're trying so hard to get people saved. What would happen if you died? What would happen if you died today? Would you go to heaven? Would you go to hell? What's, that's the apex of everything that the church is doing. We need to win souls, but we, we lead them to the Lord, and then we leave them just laying there doing nothing, hoping that when the day comes that they'll go to glory. But our highest goal is not personal heaven at all. Did you do Facebook? Is it on? Okay, I just want to make sure. Hi, Facebook. So our highest goal isn't personal heaven, 
but to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit gave you at the moment of your salvation so we could best obey the mandate of our king to go and make disciples of that king of all people on earth. That's our task. And so the end result of your personal salvation and this movement as a whole are one and the same. And that is that all people will hear the word of the Lord and all people will be saved and come to an understanding of the truth. That's the goal of your salvation. Can someone say amen? amen. Now the ones who believe it, bless you, right? Now that all in book of Acts response that we've been pressing on you not so much that I've been pressing on you, but that the Word of God has been pressing on you for months now, if not years in this church, which may describe more green seats than anything. That book of Acts response is monumental. It's substantial, and I don't, I'm not stupid. Like, I get it. Like, reach the world? Me? Me? Right? I, I, I dig a hole with a shovel. That's what I do. You want me to reach the... I, I'm at home watching my kids just trying to keep them from burning the place down, right? And you want me to reach the world with the gospel? The, this this all-in mandate to reach the world is substantial. It's a humongous task that requires a humongous commitment from us. And I would just say this, that the Bible never shies away from those two realities. That it's massive and the commitment is massive too. It never shies away from that. It never dumbs that down, right? It's, it's, it's see, like, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And seek me with your whole heart, right? And give your bodies as a living sacrifice, right? I mean, th this is all throughout the Bible, he never shy, God never shies away from these realities. And to dumb it down would be an injustice. And so for this to happen, for us to go all in like this, like the book of Acts would demand us to respond that way, for that to happen, two things have to happen. One is that you and only you have to make a decision, and maybe that decision is today, that this Building of Christ's kingdom or building Christ's church. On Tuesday night, I have a group of young men that sit and we, dis we discuss the scriptures and talk about God and all that in our discipling group. And we had this discussion. Is the kingdom now? Is it later? Is he just building the church and it's part of the kingdom that's going to come? All that. Forget all that. Who cares? You have to make a decision at some point whether that the building of Christ's kingdom or Christ's church or Christ's body or Christ's bride, that that is the singular most important and pressing matter of your life. That's it. That's all that really matters. You have to make that decision. I can't make it for you. I've been trying for 12 years to make people choose that, but I know that I can't. No one made that choice for me. I did. Because I realized that what this says versus how I lived only came to one conclusion. Life outside of making Jesus' kingdom the most important thing sucks. That's it. There's no, there's no fulfillment in that. No matter how much money you make, no how many women you have, no how good your brandy is that you're drinking, it doesn't make up for the fact that you are not living the way you're supposed to live. And so the further you get away from this and chase other things, the more tormented you're going to be. And that was me. Right? And that's you too, right? You felt it. Even if you're saved, when you veer from that, you can feel it. You know something's wrong. And I'm here to tell you afresh this morning, this is what's wrong. You're not operating as designed. That's the problem. And we need to get there. So you need to make a decision, what's the most important thing? Why are you living right now? I don't have to answer it out loud. I don't want to go around the room with a microphone and put you on the spot. But why are you even alive? 
Why are you here? Why would you come this morning? Why would you wake up today? Why? Right? There's got to be a reason, right? So you have to make that decision. You have to make that decision. And listen, love God, worship God, awesome. But the thing that people don't include in all of that is actually doing something. Right? Do something about it. If you love him, go tell the world. You got a new girl here, right? How long have you guys been dating? Don't ask him. How, many, how long have you been dating? A little over a month, right? That's all right, right? Don't you like telling your buddies about your, your beautiful new girlfriend, right? You want to tell them about it, right? Hey, look, you got, you want, I remember that when I, got, when I got involved with Meredith. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I'm so ugly. She's so pretty, right? I got to tell the guys at the dealership, just wait till you see the, guy, the girl that's coming in this place today. Just wait till you see her, right? Because when you're in love, you have to tell people, right? So don't just sit in your closet and pray to them all day, although we should do that. Get out of your closet at some point. Tell someone about Come out of the closet, y'all. Right? you got to do something about it. So you have to make a decision whether this is the most important thing or not. And that'll prioritize your time. And here's the second thing that has to happen. Once you make that decision you got to do something, right? you got to obey. He said, go make disciples of all people. You know when, you know when you're going to stop hearing me say, make disciples of all people? When you do it. Until then, you either have to come here and be tormented by this repetitive speaker, or get off your fat fanny and go do something. Make a disciple. Go find someone that you say you care about and pour Christ into them so they don't go to hell. I can't make it more bare bones than that, but it's true, right? Yeah. Quit sitting on your fanny. So I'm going to tell you the same thing that Joshua told God's people 3,000 years ago. Choose today whom you will serve. Choose today whom you will serve. Right? And that... That tense that that's written in, in the book of Joshua, is a once-for-all-time decision. You need to wake up in the morning and pray and ask for guidance. I get all that, right? I'm sorry, I repent, you know. If you confess your sin to him, he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We need that. I'm a filthy, rotten sinner all the time. I need that, right? Get it, get it, get it. But this decision, who you're going to serve is a once and forever ongoing, never stopping decision. So choose today who you will serve, right? Don't, 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 don't go back and forth between two, two choices, right? If, if the Lord is God, then serve Him. If Baal or the government or the team or my family or my profession or my money Whatever it is, is God, then follow that. But don't give Jesus your lip service. Don't be the one who Jesus would say, your lips worship me, but your hearts are so far away. Don't be that person. Choose today whom you will serve, right? So we ought to make some decisions today, once and for all. And so that's why we're here. What's up, bro? So last week we began in our study of God's unheroes, and I was wondering if maybe there's some unheroes in this room right here, right now. And we started last week in this study, and we began confronting the false, these little facades, right? These walls, these, 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 this veneer, this, this empty, dead, fake imprisonment that you and I and us put up that block God using you to do great things, right? And advance his purposes. We started knocking down those things in our series called God's Unheroes. You know, the, 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 the ones who God seems to pick, right? The, 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 there's the list. The, the unlikely, the, uh, the, uh, the unqualified, the unprepared, the, the uneducated, the, 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 the ones that you would, you would never use CC, right? You know what CC's done, right? She, I, he could never use me. Just love you. But you know what I'm saying? Like those people, like, I, I, I don't know if this is true, this is not biblical, it's just me. I think that God loves picking 
losers. Amen. Right? Because, th listen, the, you know why? Because if I was totally awesome, which I'm not, but if I was totally awesome, if I did something, kingdom advancing thing, you could praise me. Man, I'll tell you that Moses, he's like, he's really witty and he's really smart and he's really creative and he's really ingenious. He did all this, right? Because that can happen, right? You know, the, the guy, the gal that builds a company and says, hey, look at what I've done. That happens, right? Pride. So I think God likes to pick losers like me because if I do anything good at all that even smells good, the credit has to go to him because you're all like, Moses isn't creative, he's not witty, he's not intelligent, he's not creative, he's dumb. So if anyone gets saved through anything that he would say, it has to be the Holy Spirit doing it, because it's not that guy, he's dumb, right? You're not supposed to amen that part. <clears throat> so, so, so we start studying this, this unheroes thing, these regular, like why does God use these regular folks like you and I to do his work in the world. And so we started studying the, these characters in scripture, and we started with Moses, you know, famous Moses, not this Moses, but the, the real one, the, the Moses of, who am I, right? Who am I to, to stand before the, the, the most powerful man on earth and make demands of him? The guy who could just go, kill him now. Like, that could happen, right? He's a pharaoh. He thought he was a god. They thought he was a god. And this Moses, this nobody, this, this desert wanderer for 40 years who was a shepherd, fugitive, felon, sitting out in the desert for... How long have you been praying for something that hasn't happened? He was in the desert for 40 years. You know what he was accomplishing? Nothing. Nothing from w w the way we would look at life, you know, trying to be successful, get a, get a good job, have a nice business going, maybe accumulate a little 401K. You guys got a 401K, a little retirement fund? Maybe save up to move down south after you're retiring. And, right? What's this guy doing? Uh, he's uneducated, right? He, he's, he's educated in, in, in Egyptian wisdom, but, but he's going to be a Jewish leader now. What does he know about? Nothing, right? And he, and he even says, I, I can't, I don't talk good. I don't talk good. I, 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 I stutter, I, my tongue twisted, I don't know what I'm saying, I'm not a fancy uh, orator, I'm not eloquent in what I'm saying, I'm, I'm shy maybe, I don't know, I'm, just, I'm not prepared for this. I'm not your guy, God, and I can't, I can't talk good, right? But remember, 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord doesn't see things the way you do. And that's so encouraging, right? Because we would look at ourself. No one in this room, I know you guys all pretty well. I'm trying to scan here and see if there's people that I don't really know. I don't really know you guys. I don't really know you yet too much. Looking forward to it. But I know from those that have been here for a while, no one's really high on themselves in this room. I don't know anybody who's arrogant in this room, which is awesome, and I appreciate that. But... If anything, I think we'd probably tip the scales the other way and be a little bit maybe down on ourselves, like we're nothing special. And isn't that encouraging to know that we don't have to be someone special, that God can use us anyway? If he can use a guy like Moses, the, the nobody out in the desert, that maybe, just maybe, he could use me as well. Moses was a nobody out there in the desert leading sheep around for 40 years. Years. He was 80 years old when God called him from a burning bush. And we know, of course, hindsight's 2020. We can see now that this nobody that Moses was was used powerfully by God, right? The ten plagues upon Egypt, the ten commandments for God's people, right? He opened the Red Sea, manna from heaven, quail, water from rocks. Like, wow, right? He used them in a very powerful way, led two million people from Egypt to the, well, at least to the border of the promised land. 
So God can use the unqualified nobody. Doesn't that make you feel better? Unqualified nobodies? Right here? Right? Marriage failure, car salesman, porno salesman, all of that, right? But yet, you're standing here listening to me. What's that say about you guys? <clears throat> so I love you all. Thank you. So this week, though, I want to go way down further. I want, to, I want to dig down into the basement of despair, so down deep that being a nobody would be a step up, right? And some of us have such a dark and dirty past and present. Maybe you're so steeped in it right now, and there's, you know, I know you, but I don't really know you. You know, maybe there's some dark, deep thing that you're doing right now that's so dirty that you would think there's no chance of being, in, in my dark state, how could I be the light of the world? Maybe you feel that way now. And so, I offer you this message that I don't often title a message, but I want to call this message, From Tramp to Champ. Okay? From Tramp to to champ. Do me a favor. I want you to open your Bible to two places. I want you to open your Bible to Joshua chapter 2, and I want you to open up your Bible to Hebrews 11. Now, we're going to go to Hebrews 11 first, and while you're turning there and getting that ready, I wish I could have it up on the screen for your page numbers, but, you know, Joshua 2 and Hebrews 11. So, Hebrews 11, the book of Hebrews, I would just so strongly suggest that you spend time reading that book. That is absolutely pregnant, overflowing with truth. It's powerful. It's amazing. And, and we're going to find out all the different roles of who Jesus is. I once taught a series uh, on the book of Hebrews, very in-depth. It went for a long, long time. It was called Jesus, the Man of Many Hats. Uh, there's a poster for the series that I preached. It was years and years ago before we started capturing everything on film. And so it's unfortunately not archived for you. You have to read that. Maybe I'll have to preach through that again sometime in the future. And I probably will because all your faces pretty much have changed. So it would be fresh material for you. But um, Hebrews chapter 11 in particular would be known as affectionately, not, not, not divinely inspired this title, but for us, this is God's Faith Hall of Fame. Th this is the list, the short list really, of, of, of the, the people in God's uh, kingdom effort since the beginning all the way up to the end of the scriptures, right? All of these incredible people that, that, that God used in powerful ways. And the thing that they all had in common was not talent or gifting or awesomeness or looks or muscles or money. It was faith. They just trusted God. They just trusted God. They believed in, in Him, and they believed in who He was, and they believed in what He said, and they believed in what He promised. They had faith. That's what these people, famous people, you can see it there as your eyes skim over Hebrews 11 now. You'll see names like Noah, right? Noah, this, hey, listen, God got rid of everyone else on earth except Noah and his family. Why? Noah just, he had faith in the Lord. Right? He, he built a boat for a flood. He's nuts. It had never rained before like this. Like, Noah, build a boat and put all the animals in it because I'm going to pour down all this rain. It's going to be a flood. Okay. What is that? But you know what he had? Faith. So this makes no sense, God. I don't understand, God, but on your word, God, I will do it. That's faith, right? People like Noah and, of course, Abraham and Isaac and, and, and Isaac's moms, Sarah, had faith. They just believed in the Lord. They trusted him. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. These are names that you'd, of course, they'd be in the faith hall of fame. And Joseph and, and Moses, like we studied last week. And Samson and King David and Samuel. These are, and then it says, and all the prophets. Think of all the prophets you see in the scripture. Guys like Isaiah. 
Of course he's a man of great faith. And Elijah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you absolutely, no doubt they're going to be in the Faith Hall of Fame. And Rahab. Rahab. Rahab's in the Faith Hall of Fame. Who is this Rahab you speak of, Lord? And that brings us to Joshua chapter 2. Let's find out a little bit about Rahab and see how, 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 did she get in, how did she get into the Faith Hall of Fame. So Joshua chapter 2, are you there? You ready to read it with me? Okay. So Moses had brought them to the edge of the promised land. He's done. He's now um, passed and Joshua is the leader of the Jewish people, and he's the one who's going to bring them actually across the border into the promised land. So then Joshua secretly sent out two spies. I'm going to do a little bit of reading here. Is that cool? So then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, Yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land. She told them, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my family, with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town hall, into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then, when they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, We will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. And here they are. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go out into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside this house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. In other words, if they mess with you, if you're in that house and they mess with you, we will kill them. You get it? If you betray us, however, 
We are not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied. And she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. The spies went up into the hill country and stayed there three days. The men who were chasing them searched everywhere along the road, but they finally returned without success. Then the two spies came down from the hill, hill country, crossed the Jordan River, and reported to Joshua all that had happened to them. The Lord has given us the whole land, they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. Rahab was nothing like Moses, and that Moses was a nobody out in the desert. Rahab isn't a nobody out in the remote desert at all. No, I would just say that Rahab is very popular. She's very, very popular. As a matter of fact, I find it strange, and I just saw this as I was reading it to you. These two men go into a city, and somehow, word of that gets to the king. She's popular. All eyes on Rahab. But she's popular for all the wrong, dark, and dirty, and shameful reasons. She's a prostitute. The low of the lows. She's not some highly educated, high thinker. She's not some religious leader. She's not some mighty soldier. She's not some wealthy merchant. No. She's actually not a lady of respect and honor in any way, shape, or form. She's a prostitute. And I don't think that anyone, unless they're sitting here waiting for this message, like you are this morning, I don't think anyone would look at a person like that and think, well, that's the person that God's going to use. To use someone who's bad to advance something that's really, really bad. Good. Well, the truth about that is found in Romans chapter 3, where it says that no one is righteous, not even one, right? And not a single one does good, right? So some of us are gooder than others, right? Some of us are doing some good stuff more than the next guy, but when you add it all up, your big old pile of good, in God's eyes, ain't good enough. No one is good. No. Right? No one is good. <laughs> right? So here's the thing. God doesn't have a whole lot of options. Amen. Well, who's he going to choose? Where the, I want to know where the good people are hanging out, because I'd like to kick all of you guys out and get the good people in our church. <laughs> right? Where are they? They don't exist, right? Listen, you're as good as it gets. I'm as good as it gets. Ain't that sucky? But it's true, right? That nobody's good. Nobody's good. None of us are good. None of us are good enough to be used to represent the great one. Right? Jesus was perfect, and you have to represent him. Who is good enough to represent the perfect one? Nobody is good enough. But that doesn't matter, because none of us have to qualify ourselves. No one has to qualify themselves. What can you do to make you good enough to be used of God? And the answer is nothing. Nothing, right? Good news in church. We have to shake this thinking that somehow you have to earn a spot on the roster based on who you are and what you do. you got to get that out of your mind. That's stinking thinking. You can't think that way. But all of us, even those who understand that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and it's not of your own works, it's a gift of God so that no man can boast, I know that. Except I still exercise the other thing. Don't you? We all do. 
And I'll exercise that a bit. We need to get that thinking out of our mind. We've got to let God's word transform the way we think. Right? We know that it's true, but we live as if it isn't. And that's the change we need to allow to happen. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts, right? He doesn't see things the way you see them, right? This is, this is how we see things. We see things, um, you know, I, I, I come out here in a, in a fairly decent outfit and I hold up my little seminary degree off my wall in there and I, and I have a nice little smile and yeah, well, God can use that guy. That's why when, when, when someone needs to get saved or baptized, you guys call me, right? Because you can use, I've got a seminary degree. But a hooker walks in here, no chance. Not, not her, not now, not here, not for that, right? That's just the way that we think. No, we can't, how can we use the felon? I mean, Moses was, but, but, but Paul was. He was killing people, and God used him. But no, you can't use me because I'm a felon. You can't use him because he's been in jail. You can't use her because she was a prostitute or even is one now. There could be a secret in this room right now. Someone might be a prostitute right in here right now. Maybe it's not formal. Maybe you don't work for a pimp, but maybe you give your body up for something in exchange. Maybe you're doing that now. Could I be used? Could I be used? Absolutely. You know, I was reading it this, just now to you, and it dawned on me that these men went to stay at her house. Did they have... Well, I can't talk that way. <laughs> Did they have sex with her that night? Maybe. I'm not saying that they did. I mean, why'd they go to Rahab's house? I don't know. Maybe that's where it was fun. Does it, does it say? I mean, they went to Rahab's house. Might have happened, right? Does, it, does the Bible ever give us any indication that, that Rahab stopped selling her body? I haven't seen it. As a matter of fact, in this story right here, the whole story is based on her lying. Right? She's a, she's a lying prostitute. And she's in the Faith Hall of Fame. Right? She's one of the great ones, right? She's one of the people that the sports teams retire her number up on the banners. The prostitute. The lying prostitute. Now some would, let's get sideways here for a second. Some would teach, I've heard this, that that this kind of lying that she practiced here, that it was okay because it was for a good cause. It was to protect some innocent people. And I would absolutely 100% reject that teaching. That you can do whatever you want. It's non-denominational here. But I would just, I would reject that teaching altogether. And here's why. Not on my own opinion. Let's, this is what it says. Proverbs 6, 17 said that God hates a lying tongue. Now, that word hates, we did a little study on that, didn't we? That word hates doesn't always, the word that's used there, I can't pronounce it, that translates hate isn't always hate. It can have two other meanings. So maybe it's one of them. Maybe it's not that he hates it. Okay. The other definitions are foe or enemy. So, so, so at, at, at best, he hates what you did. At worst for you, he's fighting against what you just said. Right? So, it, so, so would God want her to lie? He's an enemy to that. He will fight against what you just said. Or he just hates it. Proverbs 12, 22, something similar. It says that the Lord detests lying lips. The ninth commandment of the top ten, y'all, is... Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now we can evaluate all that. We can decide what that means. Let me give you the, the um, commentary from famed Bible commentary. His name is Matthew Henry. Maybe you've heard of him. Maybe you haven't. But well respected over the years. Here's what he says about the ninth commandment. 
Let me read the ninth commandment again to you. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. This forbids speaking falsely in any matter, lying, equivocating, and in any way devising and designing to deceive our neighbor, and that is exactly what Rahab did. Did she not? She, d- she lied to devise this little scheme, this little fo- phony story to deceive those soldiers, which were her neighbor. That's exactly what she did. And the ninth commandment says, no, you do not do that. Now, here's the danger of preaching the truth. The danger of preaching the truth week in and week out is that when you tell things like this, to people who are prone to wander from the Lord that they love, prone to sin, which all of us are prone to do, we kind of run with this. Oh, I see, so I can be a prostitute and still be used of God. I can do drugs, I can still drink, I can still lie, I can still cheat, and God can use me. That's the way some people will think. You know that's so very true. But the problem is, even though things like this are in the Scripture, by no means does that mean that all the other verse after verse, this tidal wave of truth saying that there's this upward call of holiness to be holy as He is holy. Does God lie? Does He have deceitful lips? No, and you're called to be like Him. So I would reject the teaching that lying for certain things is okay. Try having your wife I tell her that little lie. Well, I did it because of this. Try that one with mom. Romans 6 1, right? Romans 6 1 would debunk that foolish thinking. And Paul says, So should we continue to sin so that there could be some more grace? Right? If, If we, at the cross, he forgave your sin. That's awesome, right? So, so listen. The more sin, the more forgiveness. I mean, that's, some people are crazy, right? That's the way a lot of people would think. The more that he forgave you of, the greater, right? So if you just told one little white line, that was the only thing you ever did wrong in your whole life, which is not the case, but if it was, and you got forgiven by Jesus for that, would that be good or bad? Okay. What if you were a mass murderer and you, and you murdered 100,000 people and he forgave you of that? That's amazing. See, that's the way we think. So some people would be like, well, so I can be a sinner. I can be a, a crook. I can lie. I can cheat. I can be a prostitute. I can, I, can, I can drink. I can do drugs. I can do porn. I can do this and that. And, and grace would abound. And what's Paul's answer to it? You can read it in your Bible. Of course not. With an exclamation mark. Of course not. That's not the way we think. Right? How about the woman caught in adultery? Was she loved by Jesus? Was she forgiven by Jesus? But what did Jesus tell her? Stop doing it, man. Right? Quit it. Go and sin no more. Acts 17.30 says that God commands everyone, say everyone, everywhere, to repent of their sins and turn to him. Everyone to stop this. Can he use you? Yes. But using you is not a permission slip to continue sinning. Using you is not, does not equate to sin approval. Right? So can he use you in your sinful state? Absolutely. Does he want you to stay there? Not at all. But just get this, even though you're there and he doesn't want you to stay there, it doesn't mean he can't use you right there. He can use you as the hooker on the street with the boots and the fishnets. He can use you, right? He can use you. Now, I love this. This is not a, this is not a definite change of heart. But I like to think of it as it is. And I like to think the best for people Look at the apparent change of heart illustrated in the story in Rahab. Watch this. Verse 11. Look at it says here. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. So she understands that, 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 that the Lord is fighting against her country. 
And it, and it doesn't matter at this point how big and bad our army is, we're going down, right? So look what she says. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of heavens above and the earth below. Amen. The Lord your God. Your God, Jonathan. Your God. It's your God. But look at the next verse. Now swear to me by the Lord. What happened to your Lord? All of a sudden he's the Lord, right? She's acknowledging who he is, and now she's saying he is the Lord. He's not just your Lord anymore. Now he is the Lord. I, think, I like to think that I'm going to see her in heaven. So God uses Rahab to advance his purposes and his mission. The, prost- the lying prostitute that I don't know if there's truth to this or not, but those two men went to her house that day. Seems too coincidental that they just stumbled upon the prostitute's house. Right? Seems a little foolish. It may have happened that way. Maybe it was just ordained of God that they would find that house first. I have my doubts. But even in the sewer that Rahab was living in, God used her in her present condition to advance his purposes and mission. Now, loved ones, I just want to remind you, that is not permission to stay where you are. It's not. He can use you now where you are, but while he's using you, he's also calling you upward to be holy as he is holy. So Rahab was used. Now, you know, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? right. I am the Lord. I do not change. You change. I change. Does he change? Not at all. So a lot of people think, well, Jesus came. Things are different. Things are different. Eh, they are in some ways. But in some ways, they're not, right? Because I see that God kind of had a sort of Rahab in the New Testament too, right? Even though Jesus came, I am the Lord and I do not change. I had a Rahab then. I have a Rahab now. Go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Let's just jump into the New Testament now and just see if I am the Lord and I do not change. And I really hope that this is encouraging you to to really let the Lord use you, even though you don't feel like you're worthy of it, right? I know all of you guys, and I know a lot of you real well, and I'm just getting to know others, and I know that there's some stuff that that would keep you from thinking, man, I could be the the next Billy Graham. I could be, right? And we think, nah, there's just no way. The arrogant people jump to that. I could be the next guy. I could be the next guy. I want to be the next guy. But most of us are not there. Most of us are like, the other end, right? Kind of our scales tipping the other way, like, eh, I, I, not me. I kind of did this, and I kind of do this right now. So I can't, how could God use this unclean fork to serve up a good meal to anybody? Rahab. So John chapter 4, I'm going to start at the beginning. I'm not going to read all of it because it's really, really long but I'm going to skim through it a little bit. Just try to follow along with me, okay? I want to, I want, the goal here is to see yourself in the text. And as Jesus interacts with this person, let him interact with you, okay? Jesus knew the Pharisees, the religious leaders, right? The, the know-it-all Jewish guys. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. I love this. Although Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. You guys should be doing the baptizing, right? Don't be calling me. I got enough to do, right? You do the baptizing. Take them to your bathtub. Take them to your pool. Take them to the lake. Take them in here. Preacher, I, it's Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and I, but I got this buddy, and they want to give their life to Christ to be baptized. You up there? Yeah, man. Okay, I'm going to come up and baptize them. Awesome dunk, right? You don't need me to do it. 
I'll make sure there's water in it and this towel's sitting over there. That's my guarantee to you. Jesus didn't do the baptizing. Who did it? The disciples did. Raise your hand if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. Wow, that's pretty cool. Awesome. We got a bunch. There's going to be a baptizing party up in here soon. Okay, so 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 because the Pharisees knew it was causing like turmoil, right? So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, he's 100% man, right? He's God in the flesh. The fullness of deity was pleased to dwell in Christ, but also as a man, tired, right? Just tired. Had a long walk. It's hot out. It's desert. It's tired. So he sat down wearily beside the well about noontime. So it's like really hot. He's really tired. And soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. I thought that was kind of strange, right? You guys understand that God opened up the Red Sea? Do you understand that Jesus walks on water? Do you understand that Jesus' power through Moses brought water from a rock? You know that, right? You've heard that story? So why would Jesus be sitting there at this well and not get a drink? Well, it says later on down there in verse 11, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, and this well is very deep. So on a natural sense, it makes sense, right? There's, there's no bucket. There's no rope. You can't get water. But Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? He brings water out of a rock. So why, why, why? Why didn't he get a drink? Why didn't he just go, like, water or whatever? You know, like, water and water would just, like, come, right? If you can make water come out of you, like, you know what I mean? The springs of living water. Like, you can get some water out of a well. But he didn't. Why? Because I just think that God wants to partner with you in his work. That's why. Doesn't that make sense? Why did he not do that? He's a miracle worker. He can raise people from the dead. you think he could get a drink. But he didn't because he always wants to involve you in his work. And so he sat there and sacrificed and waited and was thirsty because he wants to get a drink from the lady. That's why. And you're the lady. He wants to work with you to build his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. These people were not full-breed Jews. They were mixed. They were marrying in other nations, and they were not having full-breed Jewish kids and all that. You know, They weren't really like pure, and so there was this kind of a separation between the two. And, and, and modern, I wish I had my map. I had a great map for you. But then this map, you know, Israel today, the best thing I can do is use this column as the shape of Israel. You guys have all seen it on the news. You've seen it on the map. you got it in the back of your Bible. So, you know, Israel is this, this long, tall, skinny nation. It's Israel. But back then, during this time, there was kind of like three sections of it. There was Judea down here and had Jerusalem and all that. And then there was a section of it that was the section of Samaria. There was a city in it called Samaria. And then, but the section was Samaria. And then up top was this Galilee area where the Sea of Galilee was. And so in that middle area between the two full-breed Jews, if you will, was this area where there was mixed, and they didn't get along real well. Okay? And so this woman is very, very surprised that a Jew would actually even speak to her. Not only that, but she says, she doesn't just say, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, does she? What does she say? She's a Samaritan woman. Why would she say that unless that was one of the reasons that a Jew wouldn't talk to her. A man wouldn't talk to a stranger 
who's a woman. That was not appropriate. And it wasn't appropriate also for a full-breed Jew to speak to a Samaritan. So there's lots of reasons why this woman would not be used. She also came at noontime, the hottest part of the day. Tradition says that the woman of the house would come early morning before it was really, really hot. And that's when all the ladies would come to get water for the day for their families. But this woman didn't do that. This woman waited till it was the heat of the day when nobody was there so she could come and get water. And isn't it strange how that's exactly when Jesus Christ shows up. In her shame, he shows up and says, even though you're a Samaritan, even though you're a woman, even though you're those things that everyone else would qualify you as a non-contender, You're not part of this roster. He speaks right to her and asks for a drink, and she's floored. And Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. You know, I'm just noticing this now. Maybe it will help you too, that word gift. How many people in the room make a habit of buying gifts for people they hate? Raise their hand. Right? Do you get the point? Why would he buy her a gift? Because he loves her. Because he loves her. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. Well's deep. Where do I get this living water? Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty, Jesus said. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water. She misses the point completely. I love this. He says, go and get your husband. What does that have anything to do with this water? (laughs) Nothing. It would seem nothing. But it really is because he's here to prove a point. He's trying to to make something happen here. Not just to quench some thirst. Go get a Gatorade if you need that. He's like, no, no, there's more here. I came for a different reason. So anyway, she says, I don't have a husband. The woman replied, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Okay, So no matter what you want to call this, that's all Jesus is telling her here is that she's basically Rahab. You're shacking up with dudes. That, that's all there is to it, right? See, so, see, the Bible would teach us that marriage, see, this is not popular, but marriage occurs when there's PG, 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 right? PG, okay? So, so it says, don't you know that when you join your body to a prostitute, the two become one? See, we don't talk about that. We talk about, no disrespect intended to anyone in this room right now, you'll know who I'm talking about. We don't talk about marriage certificates and premarital counsel and and what goes on at the pulpit when they exchange vows. The Bible says when you join your body to a prostitute, the two become one. And the problem with this lady is that she's two become one with lots of dudes. That's the problem. She's been married lots of times. And this last guy, she's just probably sleeping with him with no heart connection, no mingling of souls, that at least, at least the other ones, maybe she wanted to, and it didn't work. Maybe she has a problem with commitment. I don't know what it is, but she's sleeping with multiple men, and this dude that she's sleeping with now, she doesn't even have the intention to stay with him. You're just shacking up. Jesus calls her out right to her face. Well, you must be a prophet. Duh. <laughs> then he goes into this big discussion with her about what proper worship is. Where, when, how. And Jesus cuts to the quick and just says, listen, it doesn't make any difference where you go. It's all that matters is that God is spirit. He's he's looking for people. He's looking for people. He's looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. 
He's not just a passive recipient of that. No, he's looking for you. Are you going to do that? Are you going to worship in spirit and truth? Are you going to look? Are you going to worship in spirit and truth? Right? Don't just show up. Are you going to worship in spirit? And, are you going to get fired up when rattle comes on? Is your spirit fired up? And are you worshiping me the way I want to be worshipped for the real true God? Or are you making some stuff up? Right? I want you to worship in spirit and truth. And so all that to just say that he calls her to himself. That's what he's doing. And you know what's interesting? It says that he had to go to, through Samaria. No, he didn't. They have to go through Samaria. Why? Because landlocked? Because the because the because it says Judea, Samaria, and, and Galilee. It says he was going to go to Galilee, right? Did he have to go through Samaria? Because of geography? I mean, he could have couldn't he have gone over to the right here and crossed over the, the Jordan River? I think it's Matthew 9 or Matthew 19. All that happens on the other side of the Jordan River. Jesus is okay with crossing the Jordan River. Lots of people in the Bible cross the Jordan River. He could have crossed the Jordan River and gone up. Maybe he could have gone on the boat out into the Mediterranean, right? Doesn't Jesus go out on the boat a lot of times? So did he have to go through Samaria? He could have vanished and appeared in another. He walked through the walls at the upper room. He could have done all kinds of stuff, right? He could have gone on a boat and gone up to, some, up to, to Galilee. He didn't have to go through it because of geography. No, he had to go through it because of mission. He had to go through it because of love. That's why he had to go through it. He had to reach this woman because he had to evangelize that city. That's why he had to go through it, right? So in the heat of the day, when nobody is around, she comes and Jesus meets her right there. He calls her sin out right to her face. And he calls her to worship himself. And then God uses her to evangelize her city. What did he tell her? I don't know. He told her this about your shacking up. He told her your worship is wrong. But later on it says that come meet the Jesus who told me everything I ever did. So obviously the whole conversation isn't in the text. But as John would go on later in his book and say that these, these did way more stuff than this, but these things have written to you that you might have life in his name. This is an adequate description of the conversation to equip anybody to do the work of the ministry. He called out her sin. He told her how to really worship. And, and then God used her to go back to the city and evangelize that city. And look at verse 30. Look at verse 30. Oh, is it verse 30? No, I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 30 of John chapter 4. Look at it. It says, the people came streaming from the village, pouring out like, revival! Everyone's going to get to church right now! Right? They, were, they weren't just dripping. They weren't just kind of drizzling. They were pouring out of that city, streaming to go see him. Right? And then look at verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed. Many believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I did. Because the woman, because of the woman, because of the shacking up Rahab of Sychar went and evangelized the city while she was shacking up. She's in a shack up right now. And she went back to that city where she's too shamed to go in public in front of people, and God used that shameful Rahab to evangelize the city, and many came to believe. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Glory to God. So maybe you're not some nobody out in the desert somewhere that feels unprepared or unqualified because you're uneducated or, un or not successful. Maybe you don't have a lot of Facebook followers or not a, not a big Twitter feed. Maybe you don't have the platform. Maybe you're a nobody. Or 
Maybe you're not a nobody at all. Maybe you're very aware of who you are. And maybe the people around you are very aware of who you are, much like the lady at the well, much like Rahab. Maybe you're like one of them. Maybe you're deep in sin right now. Is that you? Could God even use you for his mission to make disciples of all people? To increase his kingdom? Could God possibly use dark, dirty, shameful, steeped in sin people right now to distribute his love to other lost and broken people that you know? Could you move from tramp to champ? Do you think maybe Jesus took a detour this morning to come to Sychar to get a hold of you? Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Let's ask him. Jesus, we thank you for using people like Rahab and the Samaritan woman from Sychar. Thank you for using them not as an excuse to sin, for you have called us to be holy as you are holy. But in that process of change that we are all in now, first of all, we give ourselves up right now to that change and say we want that. But while that change is occurring, we would just agree with your word we would allow it to have more weight than the way we think or feel about ourselves, And we would raise our hand and say, yes, God, send me. Use me, Lord. I give myself to your use, your purpose, and your mission. Today, I choose to serve you. I choose to serve you for, the, for not just day, this day, but for all my days. Lord, I want the kingdom to come. I want your will to be done here on earth, here in this church, here in this city, here in my life as it will be in heaven. I want to change from sinner to saint. I want to repent of what I'm doing right now, not so that you'll use me, just because it would please you. It would please you if I, gave, if I laid down my sin right now. That thing that I'm thinking about right now, I would lay it down. I would turn away from it. I would say it used to excite me. Now it sickens me, and I want to live for you now. And I want you to use me, Lord, for your glory. I choose today to serve Jesus Christ, the Lord. Use me now, Lord, as I give to your kingdom, as I generously, graciously, and cheerfully ask you what my giving should look like. And I will listen to you, Lord. And I will respond. be some baskets that come through the room. Well, people coming through the room with a basket in their hand and you can 
be obedient to what the Lord leads you to do, and you can give that way, or there's some boxes on the back walls, or you can give online. There's a little giving computer in the front lobby underneath that big screen, and or you can do it on your phone, whatever, revolutionchurch.cc. Just be a part of that. Thank you. All right, Mike. Guys, just give according to the way the Lord leads. We don't insist on a certain number. Just the Bible says we should pray about everything. So you prayed. He told you. You just do what he says to do. That's it. That's it. Be a part of it. All right, guys, I've always thought that preaching was important. I'm a preacher, but I really, really think that the ultimate goal of preaching God's word would be that it inspires you to do what we're about to do. I think worship is the goal of the gathering, okay? So I'm hoping you're going to get to your feet right now, and Michael's going to start up some music, and I'm hoping that that what you've heard today, if the Lord has spoken to you about anything, that you, you let him use that to inspire you to greater levels of worship right here and right now. Okay? You ready to do it? Yep. All right, let's do it. Come on. Come on. Yes.